I thought we would focus on um, the Brent Petrie video um, since I thought it was really, really I, good. I think I listened to them two weeks ago or three weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> so let's look at Luke chapter 12 starting at verse 35. In the video, he uses both this parable, the parable of the, uh, of the wedding feast mm -hmm. and the parable of the faithful and unfaithful servant. So verse 35, yet your lo let your loins be girded and your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the marriage feast so that they may open to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will put on his apron and have them sit at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the householder had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have been awake and would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this, uh, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, Who then is a faithful and wise steward whom his master will set over his household? to give them their portion of food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Truly, I tell you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the men servants and the maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will punish him and will put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who, knows his, who knew his master's will but did not make ready or act according to his will shall receive a severe beating. But he who did not know and did what deserved the beating shall, re shall receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much is given of him will much be required. And of him to whom, uh, to whom men commit much, they will demand the more. Basically, there's a, a rough equivalent of this, this parable in chapter 24 of Matthew in the second part of the Olivet Discourse. But Luke separates the, what in Matthew is the Olivet Discourse into two separate parts. And so this part is clearly a series of parables, not only urging um, preparedness for the Lord's coming, but also their parables of judgment. And in this case, it's a parable of judgment that's much more detailed than, than the corresponding parable in Matthew. So we have. Um, the, fir the first servant, that servant whom his uh, master, when he comes, will find so doing. That's the wise steward uh, who gives the other servants their portion of food at the proper time. So he is, he will set him over all his possessions. Since the master is a, a, a is a representative or a symbol of God, setting him over all his possessions really means that um, he trusts him. Right, he'll enter into the presence of God. Then we have the second servant who sees the master is delayed 
and beats the maidservants and the men's servants and eats and drinks and gets drunk. So he's punished and put with the unfaithful. It's fairly clear what that means. Right? It means that he's sentenced, cons con consigned to hell. So much for by faith alone. <laughs> You're right, so much for by faith alone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's obviously, he's, he's put with the unfaithful, which means that he himself isn't unfaithful. Well, he also, the works he did were not good works. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. The third, the servant who knew his master's will, but did not make ready or act according to his will, shall receive a severe beating. So he's punished, but he doesn't evidently go to hell. His judgment is not great, but it's not catastrophic, evidently. But he who did not know and did what deserved a beating shall receive a light beating. Well, there's your purgatory. Well, in all probability, both of those are purgatory. Who knew his master's will, but did not make ready or act according to his will, will receives a beating. He who did not know and did what deserved a beating shall receive a light beating. And so you're, you're, you're in addition to being simply judged by your works, you're judged by your knowledge of what, by what you know you should be doing or what you know of God. Well, there was a nun at one of the classes I took a long time ago who said that she had a hard time believing that a benevolent God wouldn't accept into heaven someone who didn't know him but did what he would have wanted them to do and I, she was talking more specifically about native americans uh -huh. how they were thankful for everything they had and all that right yeah right hmm. so in the end um you know we have to recognize that that God is infinite and incomprehensible, that we tend to understand God in human terms and, and even the ways of speaking about God, given that they use our languages, which are fundamentally human and limited by our humanity, are unable to express the reality of God, and that we don't know you know, so when we were discussing the forgiveness of sins, mm. one of the things that I, I didn't discuss is that in the early patristic tradition, although you know, the Bible you know, says that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The fathers recognized that in a strictly literal sense, that wasn't possible because God is the ultimate judge. Mm. So God reserves the ultimate judgment. So just because, you know, say the, the Pope or a bishop pronounces something in a bound doesn't mean it actually will be. It means that, you know, it may be, but God is the ultimate judge. The bishop or the pope is not the ultimate judge. Hmm. So th there's always that element of the mysterious and the element of we don't know. And the element of we tend to see God in human terms. And we also tend to see God in, in self-interested terms. Within the you know context of the sort of very literalist understanding you have to 
accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, the person of Jesus, and let him into your heart and everything. That means, you know, that all non-Christians are condemned to hell. It also, you know, for evangelicals, it means most Catholics are condemned to hell because we, you know, are uh, have a number of grave, you know, theological uh, misconceptions. Uh, you know, we're I'm not surprised. We're, they think that. <laughs> we're ritualistic. We we uh, you know don't know God. We don't have a personal relation. But so much for that. So in any case, but the problem with that is who is Christ? Or is God? Yeah. Well, yeah. But but besides that. Well, he's the one who judges. I mean, I was just thinking from what you said, it's like, you know, they're saying this. Who are they to, uh, you know, say that? Um, well, I mean, they're, they're, they're uh, you know, drawing on a very literal interpretation, particularly of John's gospel. Okay, so getting back, so, so Christ, Christ is not just God, he's 100% God, and he's also 100% yeah. man. Yeah, although that that in some sense isn't the so taking John's gospel as so John's gospel is used to prove you know fundamentally that non Christians go to hell. So who does John's gospel say Christ is? The son of man. Yeah. No. The, the savior more than that you have to the messiah in him more than the savior uh -huh. good shepherd uh -huh. look at the very beginning of john chapter 1 the verse word. 1 the word the mm -hmm. word the word made flesh yeah. But more than that, more than the word made flesh. Let, let's take a look at John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. So John begins with this in the beginning, which is the way the Genesis begins, except that the mystery is that there is no beginning because God has no beginning. So, but what, so what he's really doing is taking us back to a non-beginning a, a timelessness that comes before genesis so in the beginning was the word and the word is with god and the word was god so it, it's although the trinity hasn't been been uh, you know, mm -hmm. formulated yet and and uh i mean it's an element of kind of murkiness and mystery nevertheless john identifies the word as a separate um as somehow separate from god uh, who is also a part of god so we would say that uh this is the second person of the trinity and that each member of the trinity is fully god and is together form the one true God. So he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. The word 
calls things into being. It actuates. <coughs> and that means in turn that all creation, that all life bears the imprint of God. And so if we look at the patristic tradition and many of the fathers, one can come to a knowledge of God through observing his creation. So my, my favorite examples are St. Gregory with his spiders and, and, and stinging insects. If you look at a spider and you know, contemplate, you look at the beautiful web that a spider makes. It's a, you know, insignificant little creature. And yet its web is an architectural wonder, a thing of real beauty. But and yeah. So spiders stinging insects, they're, they're hive builders. So, you know, they work together as a cohesive entity to build this beautiful hive to sustain the life of the colony. And, and those hives are wonders of architecture. So here again, we have these insignificant, in this case, insects, which you know, we see as being completely beneath and you know, uh, beneath ourselves, you know, worthy to be stomped on and stomped out. And yet they collaborate with one another peacefully to build wonders of architecture in their hives. So that's an imprint of God. Yeah. And you know, if we look at uh, all throughout the our environment, we see the hand of God everywhere where we haven't scrunched it out, of course, which you know we very much are in the process of doing. So th there's this, this, so the, you know, the problem with that first view that, you know, you have to let Jesus into your heart is that it really makes, in some sense, it denies who Christ is, that he is the word of God, that he brought into being and upholds everything around us. And it, it makes it a purely kind of, you know, ideational thing. I, you know, recognize that, that Jesus, who, um, you know, I don't see, who can be easily be a object of my own creation, is my savior. And, you know, that's, well, I mean, you know, I, I, there are some major, you know, problems with that. But, but, but the point here is that, that the imprint of God is everywhere, that we can come to a knowledge of God by simply observation of his creation, by simply observing. Um, And then you know, there's also the issue of those who do the works without knowing that they're, you know, commanded by God or whatever. Mm. So in the end, and then finally in, in both patristic theology and, and contemporary Catholic theology, there's a view that all religion to some degree points to God. So there are elements of the one true God present in all religions. So, so that makes you know, this sort of you know, kind of harsh condemnation, Christians, non-Christians, all non-Christians are going to hell you know, very dubious. Um, 
very much like you know the proposition that all Christians are going to heaven. Yeah. It's very dubious. In the end, you know, we really don't know. You know, so our understandings of the Bible and our you know, theoretical and theological constructs are simply constructs. God is sovereign. And although we may think we know what God is going to do, the reality is we can never know what God is going to do. And hence, you know, the, the fathers and the forgiveness of sins and the binding and the loosing, they recognize that God is the ultimate judge. They're not. So, um, so, so does that kind of help to address your yeah. comment? Mm -hmm. So in that parable, or Jesus' expanded parable in response to Peter's question. So we clearly have two people who are not condemned to hell, who are beaten once severely and one lightly. So that seems to correspond to purgatory. So th there's also the the the, the notion of purgatory is rejected by the Greek Orthodox Church. Mm. But you know, if we look at, so there are a whole number of views about what happens. So there's a general agreement that nothing unclean can enter heaven, which is the basis of the Catholic belief in purgatory. And, um, and there, there's a great deal actually of, of, of debate or dispute, disagreement actually within the Greek Orthodox Church about the final judgment and you know, those who are not prepared to enter heaven. So one of the views is that people are, are cleansed of their sins, either in the trial of death itself with fear, or after death when they are confined but not permanently in hell, so that, you know, you go to hell, but it's not permanently. And then that, that's from uh, Father Seraphim Rose, who was a very Condemned famous... to hell? Yeah. I thought you couldn't, you didn't have a choice. If you went to hell, that was it. Well, that's, that's Roman Catholic. Oh, oh, oh I see. Hell okay. is permanent. You don't get, no getting out of hell. It's right. an unbridgeable. Um, yeah, but this is Greek Orthodox. Okay. Uh, so this is from Father Seraphim Rose, who is a famous American Russian Orthodox priest. So, but the, the in, in Greek Orthodoxy, the major objection actually is to the extreme literalism of some um, of Catholic, Catholic uh, views of purgatory. So first of all, that purgatory is a place where one is punished. It's a really basically a place of fire where one is punished to uh, be purified of their sins. The general tendency, and in, in, so that, that's very much a, a view of purgatory in the Middle Ages mm. and, and a more modern view has uh, has seen purgatory not as a place but as a state mm. what pope benedict wrote about uh, purgatory is 
The fire which both burns and saves is Christ himself, the judge and savior. The encounter with him is a decisive act of judgment. Before his gaze, all falsehood melts away. This encounter with him, as it burns us, transforms and frees us, allowing us to become truly ourselves. And so that process may take time. Uh, time isn't the right word exactly, since there is no time. <laughs> um, but so in any case, a state and not a place. Hopefully it'll feel like an instant. <laughs> ah, after we have suffered a little. You know. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, uh, I always took purgatory as the pain and the suffering is the longing that you have to be with right. God that is so yeah. great that you are in great pain. And the thing is, is we should be glad to suffer and go through that to atone for our sins. Yeah. And, um, and that when we, when we're all done, then we can go and be with God forever and ever. Yeah. No pain. And it doesn't really need a, a sense of time as we know it, but it's a right. time that's needed to be able to be cleansed and be worthy to see God. Well, people who Probably don't believe stuff. that there's a purgatory, I can't believe that they wouldn't expect that, um, you know, we atone for our sins. I mean, I, for someone to believe that they're taken up to God just, you know, immediately and they're saved and they're in paradise and heaven. It, it's just bizarre to me because it doesn't show a great love for God. If you think, you know, you're entitled to that without atoning for any of your sins after what Christ did for all of us. So I just, you know, don't understand someone not expecting to go through a purgatory. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're all just nothing anyway. We're, we're measly worms, you know? And so we're not really worthy to, in our minds, we shouldn't feel we're worthy to be up there. Mm -hmm. But God feels we are once we are cleansed, mm -hmm. we atone for our skins. Just a reminder about the, uh, our previous review of purgatory when we were discussing it in the context of Alan Parr, in terms of biblical proofs or support, given that there's really no, that, that the biblical proofs are inferred rather than explicit but nevertheless they can you know are powerful ones the the um, parable in luke is i think a, a really powerful example in in matthew chapter 12 verse 31 uh jesus talks about sin that will not against the holy spirit that will not be forgiven either in this age or the age to come that's a peculiar thing to say if there isn't a place in the age to come where sins are forgiven. And so that leaves open the possibility that in the age to come, not a place, but a possibility of forgiveness of sin in the age to come. So, mm. so, um, so otherwise he would say, you know, that, that, uh, the the sin against the Holy Spirit simply cannot be forgiven or cannot be forgiven in this age 
or cannot be forgiven at the final judgment. But he doesn't say that. He says at the age to in the age to come. And then also remember Paul in First Corinthians uh, chapter three verses fourteen and fifteen says that if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. So he contrasts those who build on. Um, you know, solid ground whose work withstands the, the, the uh, consuming fire and those who don't, but whose work doesn't. And he says, if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. Builder will be saved, but only as through fire. So that implies that there's some okay. third state something other than heaven and hell in which those who suffer a loss are purified. So that seems really, although it's implicit, nevertheless very powerful. Uh, and also, I mean, I think it's really important to move away from the notion of purgatory as a place and purgatory as a place where punishment is inflicted, you know, sort of like, you know, you're tied to a pole and beaten with a whip for every whatever. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, what you said, Cherry, is really valuable that, you know, I mean, fundamentally, sin is a separation from God. And the pain of sin is that you're separated from God. That when we let go of our mortal bodies, you know, I think we, and conjecturally, we probably begin to see things in a somewhat different light. You know, that everything wasn't about us after all that, you know, the sort of nasty little things we did to other people were hurt them, hurt God, drew us apart from God. And that separation from God is what's painful. You know, it seems too that, um, you know, people, a lot of people have, a really hard time to be able to imagine anything other than the within the bounds of their mind and what they can you know uh, conceptualize the idea of a place they need to it, see it as a place they can't they're unable to see it as anything else and that's just the limitations of our minds and and it's similar to people who 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 um have a hard time accepting maybe uh, God always being and the, never a beginning. You know, those kind of things are beyond our, our ability to truly understand, but that's what it's all about. You know, we, we, we do understand it uh, without knowing it in the way that our minds, you know, our brains that we have are able to, and um, we still know, you yeah. know, God is there and we accept it. And, and so they, you know, people have to um, understand their own limits that cause them to have doubts. Mm-hmm. You know, both, both that and, but, and we also have to be careful about, you know, things that cause us to concretize God in a way that, you know, isn't necessarily accurate or helpful or anything else. So the Middle Ages view of purgatory as a place where punishment is inflicted is not a very um, well-founded view the the view of purgatory as a state you know 
as Benedict articulated it, you know, is much more, you know, seems to me to be much more more faithful you know, to to the teachings of the church. Um, and you know, similarly with you know, in terms of Bible interpretation, the you know, strict literalists. Um, you know, often miss the point, not often miss the point, almost invariably miss the point. You know, I mean, this is horrible Bible interpretation because their understanding the infinite God in the most restrictive, limited human terms, God is the God of the infinite, not the God of the stupid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, God yeah. Is the God, the omnipotent God, not the God who follows our rules. Yeah, I think and, that's one of the problems with all these other Christianities is that the people, the men who came up with, you know, the way they interpreted it is I think they to me at least, it seems like they were unfortunately never able to realize it. They were thinking that in, in their limited capacity, trying to put everything in the context of what they understand in our world, uh, that they could come up with answers that were easier for them. Oh, uh, yeah. So yeah. they created what they wanted to believe. Yeah, it's the to fit that it, yeah. it, everything had to fit into their yeah. understanding, their vocabulary, and, and what you know, yeah, what their concept was. Yeah, I don't think that's true of the of like Luther and Calvin, right? But it, I think it really does become true starting with the Baptists. And you know, with every Baptist has, you know, can have a private understanding and interpretation of scripture, and they're all valid, even if they're incompatible. And you know, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit gives the interpretation to each Baptist, and uh, you know, that really opened the door, uh, you know, to where we're at today. Is there anything else? about purgatory. I guess it's about 824. I guess we probably should stop there. We were this the last thing we were going to discuss is the problem of good and evil and Christianity and the problem of good and evil. So we should do that next week. Um, so I said you know less than read, simply think about you know, some issues, ways in which Christianity has contributed to evil. It's unfortunately the case that they're not hard to come up with. Mm -hmm. And you know, so the question is, I mean, there are two questions. One, how to respond to you know, people who bring it up since it's a, a major, it's a major concern for many um, non-Christians. Mm -hmm. And and then the second issue is, you know, personally, how do we respond to it? in you know our own lives given our own faith yeah that'll be a good class because the problem is you know that it causes many people to lose faith hmm.